You're listening to The Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And now, here's Stephen. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. As always, thank you for tuning in. We got a whole lot of stuff to talk about today. We got unions and how destructive they are and one of the most destructive unions in this country known to date. And then I want to get into this mask thing. We talked about it a few months ago and we were discussing a New York Times article that came out about did the masks work and will any lessons be learned? So I have the study with me that the New York Times was referring to, and I also have an audio clip from CNN and the CNN anchor throwing the study at Dr. Fauci, and his response is awful. The response to the study is awful. It doesn't make any sense, and, and we're going to listen to that, and you can see what I'm talking about. It's, it's completely ridiculous. This whole thing is nonsense, and it's a good idea that people get in front of it now before we we get into because they're they're certainly going to start these mandates again and the only way that they can't is if people just don't comply that is the only way we can do this if not then this government is going to have control over us for eternity and the only thing the only thing that mandates did during covid was one stress everyone out two violate people's rights and three give the government more power over people's bodies So really, it was a complete net negative for mandates all across the board. So that's what I want to talk about at the end of the show. And who knows, the show's probably going to get banned on YouTube because the censorship is out of control. And that's why we're going to be talking about on today's show. So first things first, since it's Labor Day, we just got done with the Labor Day weekend. I hope everyone had an awesome Labor Day weekend. Hopefully nobody partied too hard and everybody came back with their fingers and toes. Um, (laughs) With that being said, Labor Day typically marks the unofficial end of summer, thank God, especially for me here in Florida. This summer was brutal. It was a hot summer. And look, we're all used to hot summers here in Florida. But man, when it hits those 98, 99 degree days with 90 percent humidity, it gets nasty. I'm talking like Amazon jungle stuff. So <laughs> it was it was pretty brutal. So thank God summer's coming to an end. And now this is when Florida is the best. I love it here in Florida in the wintertime. We get like eight months of solid good weather, 70 degrees every day. It's amazing. So originally Labor Day was established to celebrate and pay tribute to the labor unions and laborers who played a vital role in improving working conditions and workers' rights. It became a federal holiday in 1894. I actually didn't know Labor Day was around for that long. I thought it was a more recent holiday, but it's not 1894. And it commemorates the labor movement. It also it is also seen as a day of rest and relaxation for many Americans. So <laughs> speaking of the labor. I got an article here from the Gateway Pundit, hat tip to Jack Davis over there at the Western Journal. Biden's America, majority of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, even six figure earners are overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. This is not news. I know I see something wrong with the economy, and I know all of you do too. This is something I've been saying for a long time. We're going to see some. I mean, we're going to see the most gaslighting we've ever seen in our entire lives. It is going to be the propaganda campaign. They're going to be pushing days and weeks up into the 2024 election is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen before. So be prepared. They're going to tell you not to believe your lying eyes, that the economy's great, jobs are great, job numbers are great. It is not, folks. It is not. They are lying to you, just like they lie to you about everything else. Everyone knows they can look around with their own eyes. They see the economy is not good. So every time these people come out with the stupid Bidenomics, with the stupid narrative that the economy's great, everything's just going splendid. Everything is great. We're doing a great job in world leadership, probably at the level of FDR or Eisenhower. We're holding the world together. We're building NATO as it was built to be when it was first formed to stop Russia, to stop Russia's advancement into Western Europe. And look where we've stopped them at the Ukraine and Ukraine. 
That's where we stopped them and in the Balkans. It's extraordinary uh, what Blinken has done and Jake Sullivan have done and what the president have done. All together, they're doing a great job. But here at home, and you talked about that earlier this morning, this distinction where people cannot say what you said in your article for The Atlantic. They can't breathe it. They can't believe it, which is everything is doing pretty well. We have inflation. It's continued, but it's going down. Everything is going. It's going swimmingly. You know. No, no, it's not. And everybody can see it. This is the problem the Biden campaign has. They have nothing to run on. Nothing. And the reason why they choose the economy to run on is because it's the easiest to lie about. They can go out there and spit off some facts about the labor, about the unemployment rate and and how, you know, just like they do now, where they sit there and tell you that Joe Biden has brought the gas prices down more than any president in American history. But what they don't tell you is that he's the reason that brought it up to five dollars a gallon. And so he brags about it going back down to three. This is what they do. This is why they pick the economy. It's the easiest to lie about. They can fudge numbers. They can get the CBO to come out and tell people whatever it is that they want to hear. They will cherry pick numbers. They will they will cherry pick data. But here's the problem they have is everyone can see it with their own eyes. They feel it in their own wallet. They know that the economy is not good. The American people are not dumb. This is the mistake the Biden campaign is making, and this is the mistake government makes overall. Politicians think Americans are dumb. Granted, Americans can be gullible and panicky. Look, you guys seen it during the COVID pandemic. That was a perfect example of how a government can can gain power like that in an instant. And the way they do it is with fear. They use fear. They're going to try this again in 2024. But they think the American people are dumb. American people are not dumb. This is the biggest mistake that anybody can make when running for politics. Do not underestimate the intelligence of the American people. The American people are smart. They can see what is happening. I know I certainly can in my own wallet, in my own house. I see my bills going up. I know your guys' electric bills are going up because they are going up. It's not you. It's the economy. You're talking about groceries. Groceries, on average, have increased almost 30%. So you're talking about if something cost $10 two years ago, it now costs $13. That is a big, big jump, if not more. So 30% is a lot of money when you're talking about everyday items. So they may say certain things are going down. They may say like, oh yeah, a floor cleaner is gone down in price. This is how they'll do it. They'll cherry pick data. But people aren't buying floor cleaner every day. People are buying milk. The prices of milk have went up. The prices of eggs have went up crazy. We did an, uh, we did an episode about that not long ago. It's the essential items that are going up in price. And everything is because of a shoddy economy. The economy, the Bidenomics plan is a failure, a absolute 100 failure. Everybody, and I mean everybody, even the people on the left, know that the Trump administration brought them a awesome A1 economy. That economy was the best economy we had seen in decades, decades. And unfortunately, a lot of people weren't paying attention before Donald Trump, and they only paid attention during Donald Trump. So They had nothing to compare and contrast it to until now. And so this is why I say you see a lot of people jumping on the Trump train and and rejecting Joe Biden for the simple fact that now they could see the difference. Now people can compare the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Donald Trump got people's full attention. And that is as true as the sun rising in the east. So. Back to this article, uh, hat tip to Jack Davis, a new report said a majority of Americans are just squeaking by as a mountain of debt grows taller and taller. As of July, 61 percent of adults in lending club surveys said that they were living paycheck to paycheck, according to CNBC. This is true. I've I've verified this data all through up and down every article through the stock market all the way to the leftist media outlets. People are living paycheck to paycheck more and more and more. And listen, it was hard during Trump administration. I'm not saying people weren't struggling during Donald Trump's economy, during the Trump administration. However, people had the ability to save money. Things were cheaper. Inflation was low. Gas was cheap. 
These are everyday things that when you don't have to spend as much money on them, it gives people an opportunity to save money. Now, with this economy, after two years, people have drained their savings account, and now they're putting things on credit cards, and this is why we see credit card debt at a record high. So look, everything is correlated with one another when it comes to the economy. They talk about this trickle-down economy, this, this, bull, this BS that they accuse Republicans of using when we're talking about the, the rich people that are creating jobs and corporations and how that trickles down down to the bottom. Okay, that is trickle down economics is there's no such thing as trickle down economics. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is when people at the top do good, people at the bottom do good. Everybody did good during the Trump administration. These people want to lie to you about Donald Trump only cutting taxes for the rich. That is not true. You can go to Statista. You can look at the statistics and you could see that the, the middle class America benefited the most from Donald Trump's tax cuts. Yes, the rich did get taxes cut. Yes, so did the poor. Everybody had tax cuts. However, the middle class benefited the most. So the study found that 78% of consumers who earn under $50,000 a year and 65% of those who make between $50,000 and $100,000 annually were living paycheck to paycheck in July. This is crazy. You guys remember, like, making $100,000 a year... That was a good job. You're talking about six figures. You guys remember talking about when somebody says, oh, yeah, I make six figures, I make six figures. That's a good job. And if these people are living paycheck to paycheck, you have a huge, huge problem. And not us, but the Biden campaign does. The Biden administration caused this. I just want everyone, I want to be very clear about this. The economy was roaring back unlike anything we've ever seen up until April or March of 2021, when Joe Biden and these leftists and the, the corrupt D.C. establishment, the Uniparty, starting in, started injecting their policies, their awful, awful ideas onto our economy. And most notably, the war on energy and the war on fossil fuels and the massive, massive spending. The spending, inflationary spending, was the biggest mistake that the Biden administration could make. They spent way too much money at exactly the wrong time. You do not spend inflationary. That is like me maxing out all my credit cards, maxing out living paycheck to paycheck, no money. And then I call the credit card company and say, hey, I need a credit line increase. That is exactly what the Biden administration did in during this administration throughout these last two and a half years, almost seven trillion dollars in two and a half years. That is insane. And the reason why I say Uniparty, it's not just his fault, but there were 16 Republicans that signed on to that stupid omnibus bill. You guys remember that that was the nail in the coffin to this economy. The CBO came out and said that Joe Biden better not spend this money because it's going to create inflation. And Joe Biden did it anyways. And then they had the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act was a scam, was the biggest scam portrayed on the American people in the last six years. A ginormous, ginormous spending bill crammed with all this renewable energy, green energy BS. It does. It did absolutely nothing for inflation. But they called it the Inflation Reduction Act. Why? Because they pulled it and the American people said inflation was the biggest problem they were facing today. And so what did these corrupt cronies do? They call this massive spending bill with all this pork and spending going money flying all over the place, literally dropping money from the skies, making it rain cash on the country. And that is what caused inflation. It did not fix inflation. The reason they called it the Inflation Reduction Act was so that they could get it by through the media. These people do nothing but figure out ways to try and trick and lie to the American people. They are the best at it. The best. And unfortunately, the Democrats are way better at it than Republicans, but Republicans are weak and cowardice. They go with the flow. The reason why these 16 Republicans, and trust me, I got the list. We are going to go through their names when the time comes. Because these people, the 16 Republicans, need to get voted out. 
One of them's Tom Cotton, and I really like Tom Cotton. I, I, I really do feel highly about him. But we cannot have a Republican that's going to be fighting for conservatism and fighting for the liberty and freedom of the American people and prosperity of the American people if he's going to go along to get along with the Democrats signing a bill, a massive, massive spending bill. I don't care if it was for the military or not. It doesn't matter. This is, this is insane. So 44% of those earning more than $100,000 a year were living check to check, the study said. Consumers are undoubtedly continuing to feel the impact of inflation and rising interest rates, said Chris Fred, the head of TD Bank's credit cards and unsecured lending. Credit card debt reached $1.03 trillion in the second quarter of the year, according to The Week. Credit card delinquencies hit 7.2%. That's people not paying their credit card bills. So you're talking about families that have racked up their credit cards and now are unable to pay their credit card bills. We all know what happens when that happens. You have this runaway interest effect, this this runaway interest, which means interest compounds. If you cannot make the payment, at least the minimum payment, then it's going to be a disaster. This is what the Biden administration, this is what this government and this treasury and this the Federal Reserve has done to the American people. They have destroyed this place, destroyed this place, destroyed it all in the name of COVID and Inflation Reduction Act. It is sick what they've done to this place, sick. And trust me, folks, you're not going to tell the arsonist to put out the fire. These people are unable to fix this because they don't know what they're doing. You're talking about a massive, bloated, swamp bureaucracy that created this mess, and they don't have the ability to even see what the problem is, more or less fix it. This is why these people must be taken out of office in 2024, or this is going to get a lot, lot worse. And unfortunately, it's going to get worse anyways, because we still have another year and a half of this. But people need to know the reasons why we are in this situation to begin with. So an increase in delinquencies and defaults is symptomatic of tough decisions that these households are having to make right now, whether to pay their credit card bills, their rent, or buy groceries, said Mark Zandi, Moody's Analytics and Chief Economist, according to the Washington Post. The Post noted that the annual credit card interest rate is 20.6%. That is insane. Insane. Quote, people don't like going into default or delinquency with their credit cards. It makes a lot of people feel very nervous and unhappy, said Neil Saunders, managing director for retail at Global Data. It underlines how much consumers are under pressure, and it's one of the cracks that's appearing in the consumer economy. Economist David Rosenberg said a recession is looming, and debt could be what pushed the nation into one, according to The Insider. We just replaced credit cards with what happened with with subprime mortgages 15 years ago. This is how a recession starts. It starts with a significant erosion in credit quality in one particular asset class, and right now you're seeing it in credit cards. And it is not insignificant, even though it's not residential mortgages, like 2008, he said. We've had a massive interest rate shock. We haven't seen the full impact yet. Part of this has been blunted by two things, student debt relief, done. And stimulus checks over $2 trillion. Done. On top of that, we have China seemingly heading into some sort of recession. Certainly, it's already entered a structural slowdown that's bumping up against a silical slowdown, and it's exporting deflation to the rest of the world. Bidenomics is making life worse for Americans. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Jason Smith, a Missouri Republican, said in a statement on his website, quote, the American people are still being throttled by the Biden administration's disastrous agenda and reckless spending. Under Republican economic policies, job growth reached historic highs while lower income workers saw 50 percent higher wage growth than high income earners. Yes, this is true. This is what I was just talking about, how you, the middle class, people in the middle class could actually feel like they were getting ahead because they were. Their money was going a lot further. Their wages were increasing and the inflation was staying the same, which is the exact opposite of what we have now. Now we have inflation that is surpassing wage increases, which means If you got 10% inflation, if you don't get a 10% wage increase, then you're still losing money. Mind you, the inflation's compounding. So this happens yearly, year after year. So 10% and 10% is 20%. In two years, 
things would go up 20%. This is how compa- compounding inflation works. Now, they say they got the inflation down to like 6% or 5%. That's still high, and it's not outpacing wage growth. This is a problem. This is why every single week you feel like you're getting further and further behind. Every single week, people, people's money is worth less and less and less. This is because of Bidenomics. Today, under President Joe Biden, the situation is reversed and lower income workers are suffering the most. 63% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. This has been exacerbated by higher prices that have robbed every working family of, get this, $10,000 per year and stifled economic growth. Overall, the cost of living has risen 16% from inflation since Biden took office. Tiana Lo Dasher wrote in an op-ed in the Washington Examiner, that means Americans have lost 16% of their spending power. This is what I was just referring to. So the numbers are even more egregious when you break them down by categories on which the least privileged spend a disproportionate amount of their incomes, Deutsche wrote. The consumer price index specifically for food is up 19% since January 2021, and electricity prices are up 23%. Used car prices, this one is crazy because I just went through this debacle with used cars. Used car prices are up a staggering 30%, and car repairs cost 23% more than two years ago. This is awful, folks. This is is wrecking people right now. These kinds of numbers right here are disastrous for any economy, anybody. I don't care if you are the only way you are not feeling the impacts of this economy is if you're the is if you're a multimillionaire. If you are a multimillionaire, you can you can kind of withstand this type of economy. This is why the rich elite ruling class, they have nothing in common with the American people right now because they are not struggling like the regular American people are. These people don't pump their own gas. They probably couldn't even tell you what gas prices are. These people don't buy their own groceries, so they don't even notice the influx in grocery prices. This is why it is so important that we get people in there that know and understand what struggle is. We have to get people in there that know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. We have to get people in there that understand what the American people need. And I'm sorry, but it's the the Obama staffers and the Obama cabinet members and Joe Biden and the Biden administration. It's not it. These people are not it. Joe and Mika have nothing in common with the American people. These people live in Boca Raton in some sky rise condo. They have no clue, no freaking clue what the American people are going through right now. And that goes for all the other news anchors. That goes for all the other rich elite Democrats that want you to continue voting for your own destruction because these people could care less. It is it's it's truly disgusting. It really is. So I'm going to post this article in I didn't um, I didn't finish it all the way. There's a lot more, but this is originally on the Western Journal, but I'm going to post this in my podcast description. And so you guys can go back and read it. And, and it digs in a little bit more with what people are going through right now. So I just figured that was getting people up to date with the economy right now is perfect timing for Labor Day. This is the thanks the American people get for busting their ass so hard every single day. They get Bidenomics. This is a freaking disaster. I just found it so fitting to talk about the economy and the American working people living paycheck to paycheck on Labor Day weekend. It's kind of fitting, right? It would have been nice for Biden to be able to come out and say, yeah, the economy's doing great. Well, he does say this, but it would be nice if our economy was really good right now. Honestly, if it wasn't for the economy, I don't think people would have any problem voting for Joe Biden. I really don't. People people are pretty clueless when it comes to this administrative state power, this this totalitarian regime, the rise of this totalitarianism that we're watching. A lot of people don't notice it and it it kind of it kind of, you know, it kind of drives me nuts, but you know, I understand that not everybody reads the news all the time. Not everyone gets in the politics like I do. So I just wish more people would be paying attention to this absolutely tyrannical, tyrannical regime that we're watching rise to power in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. It's disgusting. It's a true uniparty. It's a a out of control, rogue government, a rogue justice system and a rogue administrative state that is just stomping on the necks of Americans with their boot. So. Something else I thought was fitting. So speaking of unions. 
I wanted to talk about the most destructive union known to date, the NEA, the teachers union. So not only is the economy bad right now, but our education for our young Americans is an absolute disaster on every single level. And that's something else the American people can notice with their own eyes. So from Fortune.com, America's education system is failing, but a growing school choice movement believes it has the solution. This has been a Republican stance from as long as I can remember. Even when I was a Democrat, Republicans supported school choice. And obviously, I was not really for school choice because I knew it would disenfranchise a lot of students. However, that's not always the case. And I changed my mind on school choice because I feel like if we are truly going to have individual liberty and freedom and the American people are going to be taxed for a, a school system, then that money should follow the student. And so therefore, no student should suffer. Because the taxes that the parents pay, the taxes that go towards that child's education should follow that child into whichever school that they want to go to. Obviously, whatever's available, but it just makes sense. If your child is not getting the education that they deserve or need, then it makes sense to be able to take their money that the parents are spending on that child to go to school through taxes and property taxes and so forth to take that money and put them in another school that would better benefit the children. It just makes sense. Like, why does the federal government insist on having a bunch of stupid children? If students are failing, there's a reason why. And the reason is the teachers' unions. So American students are in trouble. About a third of students in the youngest grades are behind on reading. Only 36% of fourth graders are proficient at grade-level math. The newest national assessment for educational progress, the NAEP, which is essentially the nation's report card, shows eighth graders' history scores are the lowest on record since the assessment began in 1994. And what's more, every single state experienced teacher shortages in at least one subject in 2022. This is something that I'm noticing even in our local schools here, is the teacher shortages. I don't know what the deal is. I have no idea what the problem is. Maybe it was vaccine mandates. Just saying, maybe you had a lot of teachers out there that didn't want to get jabbed in the arm with a vaccine mandate. I'm just going to throw that out there. But there were teacher shortages even beforehand. We've always had some kind of teacher shortage. But this is something much different. And you notice how one of the biggest things that the students are failing in is history. To me, this is the biggest disservice to our children, is not knowing history. History is so important. It should be the most taught subject in every single school because history does so much for a person. And I'm not talking about just United States history. I'm talking world history, the ancient Romans. If students learned about ancient Rome, that they would learn about why we have the laws and judicial structure that we have today. Ancient Rome was the founding of a representative government. Essentially, all of the rules and laws that we have today are judicial structure. Our, almost our entire government is, our government is structured around ancient Rome. So the very idea of a republic, the concept of a republic, where we had elected representatives and the, that govern on the behalf of the people, was heavily influenced by the Roman public. The founding fathers admired the Roman model of checks and balances between different branches of government. This is our foundational principles of our country came from ancient Rome. So wouldn't it be fitting for students to actually know that that's where a lot of our ideas for our country, for our government, for our constitutional republic came from? I mean, even the, 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 the idea of a Senate with its two senators per state was inspired by the Roman Senate. It was the key legislative body in the Roman Republic. Same thing with separation of powers. The founders embraced the Roman idea of dividing government into three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, so that it could prevent any one branch from becoming too powerful. Exactly what we're watching happen today with the Biden administration. 
The Biden administration, this fourth branch of government that they have created for themselves, this is how they have back doors, like rule changes for the ATF to where they can ban pistol braces and, and vaccine mandates from OSHA, subverting Congress. They were able to force the shots into the arms of people by using OSHA. This is what they do. This is that fourth branch of government they are creating where it's supposed to be three branches that all have equal amounts of power that all keep each other in check. But this fourth branch that this Biden administration, this bureaucracy, this uniparty that the Washington establishment has created over the decades is subverting all of that. So the very fundamental principles that our country was founded on is being subverted by this uniparty, this corrupt Washington establishment. And also, if students knew about ancient Roman history, they would know about law and justice and how this right now we're watching the Democrats indicting former presidents, indicting their political opposition is would never happen. This is exactly why it's important for students to know the history of the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, because the American legal system, including the use of juries and the principle of innocent till proven guilty, has roots in the Roman legal traditions. So the, the very term innocent until proven guilty came from ancient Rome. This is how deep rooted our constitutional republic is to the ancient Rome, to history. So this, all these things that we see today are all from ancient Rome, and it's so vital for our students to know this, and they're not going to know it if they're not being taught history, which is one of the biggest subjects that seems to be failing our children today. So, you know, it's, it's and you know what, I can't help but to think that it's because this indoctrination mill, it's because of the unions and the schools they're too focused on creating little social justice warriors, and they're too afraid of teaching kids history because they may be conservative. That's what it is. They know that if they were to teach kids accurate history about the ancient Romans, our founders and framers, and how this country was really based off the ideas of the ancient Roman Republic, then they're afraid that all those kids might grow up to be conservatives. That's what it is, folks. And really, the ancient Rome is just one piece of where this country uh, got its ideas from. So while they were inspired by the Roman concepts, they also drew from various other sources, including philosophers, British political thought, and also their own experiences. So you're talking about guys that just got done fighting a revolutionary war. <laughs> I mean, they were so dedicated, and I always say this, they're the smartest people in, they were the smartest people in the world at the time. Writers, lawyers, soldiers, George Washington. I mean, these people were the best of the best this country had to offer, and it wasn't even that long ago. And here it is, we're already wrecking the place. Ancient Rome, they say, lasted 1,000 to 2,000 years, depending on, you know, they're, it's not really accurate when it actually fell. It didn't happen overnight. But folks, we're at 250 years. We're not even going to make it to 300 years because we have Democrats progressing this country to a, a, to, into oblivion. The, they're progressing so much. They're actually, they're so progressive. They're actually regressive. They're taking this country back. They're actually bringing back racism. They're actually bringing back segregation with all black dorms, all black colleges. Like it's just, it, it just, it doesn't stop. They, the progressives won't stop until the, you make them stop. They have to be told no. And unfortunately, we haven't had leaders with the balls big enough to tell them no. And so this is why we are where we are right now. But I think it's key, it's vital to teach students the importance of history. This, if you couldn't tell, pisses me off the most about what the schools are not teaching. This is why we have little social justice warriors growing up and trying to change the country because they think the country's evil. They think the country is, is a racist, is systemically racist, and that the country's so bad the founders were all, are all evil, racist slave, slaveholders. This is what our schools are teaching our children. They're not teaching our children to be uh, contributing members to society, to being just happy people. No, they're teaching them how to be little social justice warriors 
and to try and fundamentally change this country. History to me is so important because because history gives wisdom. Wisdom is so more is so much more valuable than intelligence. Everybody knows that there's a difference between a street smart and a book smart person. Book smart and street smart are very different. What essentially what that is is wise and intelligent. Wise people are going to have a better chance at being successful. They're going to have a better chance at living a happy, prosperous life because wisdom is one of the best attributes anybody can have, certainly our children. We need more wisdom in our society, hands down. Hands down, wisdom is the best. And the only way you get wisdom is by history. That is it. That is the only way. Wisdom is essentially learning from other people's mistakes. Not only that, but also learning from people's successes too. But the only way to actually put it to work, the only way to actually make it useful is with history. History by far is the most vital subject in any teaching, in any academia, hands down. That is really, I guess you could say that's in my opinion, but I don't think you'd find too many people to disagree with that statement. All right, so going on, going back to the article. So while many of these problems began before COVID-19, there's no denying that the pandemic paused or reversed academic progress for kids across the country. This I agree with. The NAEP showed that for both fourth and eighth grade students, reading scores declined in at least 30 states and jurisdictions and math scores declined nearly everywhere from 2019 to 2022. Perhaps most troubling is how the pandemic made existing achievement gaps worse. Stanford University researchers conducted a district-by-district analysis of the NAEP results and found that students in low-income school districts and communities experienced the biggest learning losses. Boom. Imagine that. And you know what? I think we need to change the narrative here. We need to stop blaming all this on the pandemic. All this damage was caused not by the virus, not by COVID-19, but by lockdowns. This was all self-inflicted, folks. All of this damage was self-inflicted with lockdowns, the two-year lockdowns, the disaster, this, this human pandemic that they brought and reigned upon this country did astronomical damage. I mean, it is it, it's it's not even quantifiable the amount of damage. And we're just now able to calculate the numbers. Now we're actually three years later starting to see the damages that were caused. We're talking multi-generational damage done to our country and its people because of lockdowns, not the pandemic lockdowns. We didn't have to lock down our country. And in fact, I know there's a couple countries that didn't lock down. They certainly didn't close down their schools. Sweden did not lock down their schools. Not once did they did they lock down their schools. Not once. And they are not suffering the problems that we are today with our students. So how do we get American education back on track? A part of the solution will come from increasing the range of options that families have when choosing schools. The NAEP's wake-up call shows that a one-size-fits-all approach isn't working for all students. It's not. It's just not working. This is the problem with government-run education. That's essentially what we have. Ever since the Department of Education took over the schooling system, it it has been on a steady decline ever since. Why? Because the government cannot create prosperity. The government destroys everything it touches, and the education system is no different. And so because the government has taken control of the education, everybody knows that government programs can't fail. There's we are paying for like 1500 programs that have been in rotation, getting money, getting funds for like 30 years and they're failures. One of the biggest examples I can point to is the VA. Another example is United States Postal Service. Now, a lot of people think that the USPS, the post office is is taxpayer funded. It is not. It is funded by their stamps. However, every 10 years. Its net loss calculates into the billions. And guess who gets bailouts all the time? The post office. And who pays the bailouts? The American taxpayer. So yes, the U.S. post office, the postal service may say we are not funded. Our revenue does not come from the taxpayers. However, when you get bailouts every five to 10 years for $10 billion, 
That to me is a taxpayer funded entity. And so which is another gigantic failure, a, a failing government program, the way that it's ran, the everything about it is just it's slow, it's bulky, it's bloated, it's wasteful, it's inefficient and ineffective. Typical, typical government program. The Department of Education is no different. The VA, same thing. Everything the government touches, it destroys. And so our education system is no different. And this is why school choice needs to be implemented. It has to be. We have to give our kids a chance. The government is not going to admit at its failures. It never will. Is anybody talking about defunding the Department of Education? No. Why? Because it just sounds bad. The only people talking about defunding the, the Department of Education are Republicans. And look what happens to them. So this is why school choice is necessary. So all it's doing is just allowing students to go to different schools. What, what is the outcome of that? Well, I don't know. If a school is doing a crappy job, then it probably should be better, right? It should probably try to improve. That is the only way. The only way these schools are going to improve is if they have to improve or they get shut down. Just like any other business out there, everybody knows that a government business can't fail. Why? Because it can't fail because it's constantly propped up with money from the taxpayers. And so if a business were to do bad, were to lose money, were to be in debt all the time, it would go out of business. The problem with the government business is it can never run out of money. It has no incentive to fix itself. And so my theory is if you allow these kids to leave and go get a better education, first of all, the kids are getting a better education. So therefore, you're going to have a more intelligent society. You're going to have a better you're going to have a generation where kids are actually educated, you know, and not with this Marxist DEI SEG BS. This 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 garbage that they're learning in schools now. So if a school doesn't correct itself, guess what? It goes out of business. It goes out of business. And then those students will then go to another school. This will incentivize schools to do better. It, it will, I'm telling you. If you make these schools realize that they're not just going to get a rubber stamp check, if they're not just going to get a check in the mail every month, then they will do better. It is the only way. We cannot keep going down this, this decline. This, it's like a, a it's insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again. Nothing is going to get better. The schools suck because the government is involved. Remove the government and you will see the schools get better. If you're not going to remove the government, then let the children remove themselves and go to a different school and get a better education, period. It's a no-brainer. And so school choice programs mean that students aren't locked into attending a district public school based on home address. Instead, they provide parents with funds that could be used towards a broad range of options, including secular or religious private schools, as well as charter schools, which are publicly funded schools that have greater autonomy. School choice makes it possible for all students, regardless of economic background, to get an education that matches their needs and interests. Depending on the student, that could mean a smaller school, one that caters to learning differences, learning differences or one that focuses on arts, athletics, or science. This is a win-win for everybody. This is what I don't get, why the Democrats don't support this. I really don't get it. I really don't. <clears throat> so to make sure more students get the best education they can, my organization, the Daniels Fund, has committed to adding 100,000 seats to non-traditional schools by 2030. Spread across the four states we serve, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, this big bet will increase the attendance capacity of non-traditional schools in our region by nearly 30%. It's no brainer, folks. You are getting a better education at a private charter school, a private or charter school. You just are. Public education, which is now government education, pretty much, is it's turning into a propaganda mill. It's turning into an indoctrination factory is what it is. These kids are coming out completely clueless about the real world. They go into college and then come out a bunch of radical leftist Marxists. The, the schools are giving us some pretty awful results when it comes to education and educating our children. I mean, it's just think about it. These kids come out of school not knowing nothing. They don't know anything. They cannot make a resume. They don't know how to open a business. They don't know how to get a mortgage. They don't know how homeowners insurance works. They, and this is just the things I could think of off the top of my head. They can't work on their own car. They can't even check their own oil. These are all things that people should be coming out of high school knowing how to do. 
would they not be more effective and have a better chance at living a more prosperous life if they just came out if they were just taught these types of things in high school? I mean, replace algebra with any other subject when it comes to better life skills, and that child would be better off, and nobody's going to miss the algebra. I mean, come on, man. Algebra is ridiculous. This is something people have been saying for years. There's no point for algebra. Instead of teaching somebody what X times Z to the fourth power is, teach them how to change the brakes on their car, or teach them how to file for an LLC, or teach them how to create a resume. These are all things that students will be coming out of high school knowing how to do. They are going to have a better shot at living a more prosperous life. I guarantee it. But the kids that are coming out of school today, they're, they have no clue. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. High school should be more like college. Middle school should be more like high school. I've been saying this for years, almost ever since I've, I've left the Democrat Party. When I started getting wise to all these tricks and about how government destroys everything it touches, I started thinking about how bad our education system is and how these kids, me personally, came out of high school not knowing really how to do anything. I went right out of high school into a minimum wage job. Yeah, because I didn't know anything. I had no special skills. I had nothing. I, I went to work with my brother as an electrical apprentice. This is when I actually started learning stuff. But you know what would have been really beneficial? If I learned how to wire up a house in high school, I would have been able to come out and make 60 grand a year right out of high school. I wouldn't have to go to college and go get into $250,000 worth of debt to come out with a degree that I'm not going to use. So it's like, doesn't it make sense to educate our kids with things they're going to need and actually use in the actual, in the real world? And so this is just another thing why the Democrats need to be defeated in 2024. It is not just the Democrats. It's Republicans too. This is why the corrupt establishment uniparty in our nation's capital needs to be defeated in 2024. These people are ruining, they are ruining this country and its people. They're destroying everything. How many of these politicians and these bureaucrats do you think send their kids to public school? Not one. Well, then why do the regular American taxpayers deserve a crappy school system? I mean, seriously, why is it the American taxpayer that pays all this money, all these taxes, which I think is theft, by the way, but I'll di- I digress. We'll save that for another show. Why do all these Americans deserve a crappy education for their kids when they're paying a, an absorbent amount of money in taxes specifically for education? They are destroying the education system. And so two things needs two things need need to happen. The government needs to dissolve itself from our education, which means the Department of Education needs to be dissolved and disbanded and out of the school academia, out of that sector. Or they need to allow school choice. Let the taxpayers money follow the children to which school they want to go to, whichever school they to whatever school they want to go to. It makes no sense to keep these kids in schools they're not learning anything in, period. To keep a child into a school that people know is failing the child is borderline child abuse. I mean, is it not? The Democrats and anybody that's anti-school choice should have to explain why they think children deserve a, a failing education when they can just as easily take the money that they're spending and go take it to another school. I'll tell you why. The teachers union. That's why the same union that destroyed, that brought the education system down from the very beginning, the NEA. So I got an article here. It's a little old. It's from April 13th, 2021. It's hat tip to Alex Newman, and it's from Illinois Family Institute. So it's a long read, but I'm going to leave it in my podcast description so you can read it. It's important. And it's titled, How Socialists Use Teachers Unions Such as the NEA to Destroy Education. So when examining the Hydra, that is the collectivist education establishment that dominates public schools in the United States, among the most important tentacles have been the teachers unions, especially the National Education Association. Along with other leading unions, the NEA and its affiliates at the state and local level played a leading role in transforming American education into the dangerous disaster that it has become. The extremism has been getting progressively more extreme for more than a century now, but it's not new by any means. 
The destructive role played by the NEA is so serious and so widely understood that in 2004, even then, U.S. Secretary of Education Rod Page described the union as a, quote, terrorist organization. That's crazy. But in reality, the NEA has done far more damage to the United States than a simple terrorist organization ever could. Consider that terrorists merely kill individuals, even if sometimes in large numbers, but the NEA and its allied unions have helped to practically kill a nation, the greatest, freest nation that ever existed. While terrorists destroy human bodies, the NEA has worked to destroy human minds and human freedoms. For at least a century, the NEA, founded in 1857, is a professional association, has barely bothered to conceal its leadership's affinity for communism, collectivism, socialism, humanism, globalism, and any other dangerous isms that threaten individual liberty. Nor has the union shied away from vitriolic attacks on the United States, the free market system, Christianity, the family, or educational freedom. Perhaps the most important expose ever written on the NEA was the 1984 book called NEA, Trojan Horse in American Education by Dr. Samuel Blumenfield. Packed with examples and references, Blumenfield's book proved that to contrary to popular mythology, which holds that the NEA's extremism is a more recent phenomenon, the union's leaders have been radicalizing teachers against America for a century or more. This, ladies and gentlemen, I believe is why you're seeing such radical ideologies in our society today. These kids, the generation of all these people that are in the White House and in the upper echelons of leadership roles today are is exactly why we are experiencing the radicalization of our society today. These people that this book is talking about uh, in 1984, all these people are growing up now. All these people find themselves CEOs of T-Mobile, find themselves as CEOs of big, giant Fortune 500 companies uh, using ESG and DEI. All these kids that are now growing up find themselves at the upper echelons of our of our government, whether it's in, in any sector, one of the two million employees that are in our nation's capital today. This is what it is. This was a plan. And I'm telling you, Yuri Bezmenov talked about this in that 1980 interview that he did about how they use the education system. They need one generation. They indoctrinate one generation, and then that sets off a chain reaction. And with those indoctrinated people grow up, get in leadership roles, and then force all their ideologies onto the rest of us. And there's no, listen, there's no talking them out of it. They don't even know they're being radical. They think what they're doing is normal. They have no clue that they have this kind of radical, uh, this radical mentality. They have no clue, but what they're doing is they're forcing it onto the rest of us. Since being overtly taken over by progressives early in the 20th century, the NEA has subjected its members to an unrelenting hatred of capitalism and an unceasing, uncritical benevolence towards socialism, wrote Blumenfield. But even before that, it was bad. From 1857 to the present, the NEA has worshipped two gods, Horace Mann, a statist, and John Dewey, a socialist. Blumenfield continued, referring to the two most important figures in the hostile takeover of education by government. This series on education has dealt with both of these subversives extensively. So replacing liberty with collectivism. Once progressives were totally in control of the NEA leadership, a story detailed in Bloomfield's book, there was no longer any inhibitations in openly promoting the triumph of collectivism over liberty using the school system. At the annual NEA meeting in 1934, Willard Givens, who was soon to be appointed executive secretary over the union, laid out the agenda. And I quote, many drastic changes must be made, Givens declared. A dying laissez-faire must be completely destroyed, and all of us, including the owners, must be subjected to a large degree of social control. The major function of the school is the social orientation of the individual. It must seek to give him understanding of the transition to a new social order. This guy was actually talking about this in the 1930s. It's, I mean, the executive secretary over the union, over the NEA, was talking about turning kids into socialists. It's crazy. And this is why you have such a collective, a collectivism mindset in our people today. 
in the people out there, where they want universal basic income, where they think Plumber Joe should pay Danny's degree in political science or or his degree in some some BS degree that he spent four years getting and is now $200,000 in debt. This is why people think Plumber Joe should have to pay for that. This is the collective mindset. This is they these people don't believe in individual freedom. They don't. This is why they're so gun ho on the government controlling climate change. This is the whole climate change movement. They want government to be in control of the people because they think government is better at controlling people. They know that the government is the only thing that can control the people. They want the government to destroy people's individual rights and liberties because then the ends justify the means. And that if the government could just stomp their boot onto the faces of the American people, then the government would be able to enact more stricter climate change laws. This is what they want, man. They have the collectivist mindset. They want collectivism. This is why Biden just said the other day. You guys remember when he said this? Here, check it out. Rebecca put a teacher's creed into words when she said, there's no such thing as someone else's child. No such thing as someone else's child. Our nation's children are all our children. This is, this is so typical of socialism. These types of comments like this. And this just came from the president of the United States, Joe Biden. So you can't sit there and tell me that these, these teachers unions haven't had an impact on our, on our nation's students throughout the last five decades. Of course they have. And this is the result of it. We are so on the brink of watching our capitalist system collapse. We are so on the brink of on recession. We're on the brink of war. We are on the brink of this entire damn thing collapsing right in front of our eyes. And it can't be on accident because it happened in record time. Folks, I've been saying this for a long time. If you were going to destroy a country, you would not do anything different than what the Biden administration is doing now. And we all know it's not Joe Biden calling the shots. It is a, a small group of people in the upper echelons of the White House, of the bureaucracy that are making all these shots. It's Obama, Podesta. I have no idea who it is. Nobody does. So as of right now, nobody knows who's running our country. And nobody can explain why in two and a half years we went from peace and prosperity to absolute the dredge of society with super high inflations, a um, trillion dollars in credit card debt, a crashing house market, in, uh, spiking interest rates, spiking suicide rates. I mean, it is just go down the list. Every single metric of a collapsing society we are watching happen right before our eyes. I did a show about this not that long ago. What we're watching right now is eerily similar to how four major ancient civilizations all collapsed in the past, all the way from the Mongolians to the ancient Rome. We are going through the same things right now. And, the, and what happened was this collectivist mindset and where they did not want to stick with their country's culture. They did not want to stick with their country's history. They wanted to fundamentally change. There was a generation that came about and it didn't happen overnight. It happened in generations, but there was a butterfly effect. There was a cause. You had a generation of people that wanted to fundamentally change their civilization. And in doing so, they lost their, they lost their roots. They lost their culture. They stopped believing in God. They stopped believing in their religion. They lost the religion. And then these are when, this is when these societies collapsed. And so we're watching it right now. You see it. There's less people that believe in God today than there was 40 years ago. The more God is removed from society, the worse things get. And it's not just God that is one aspect. Although it's key, it's not the only factor. There's a lot of other things that are happening right now that people just don't see. Like this BRICS, this whole BRICS thing. You have other countries that are saying almost the, that are seeing exactly what I'm seeing right now. They see the collapse in the United States economy. They see something very, very sinister happening in our country. And this is why they are leaving. They are trying to drop our dollar. They are trying to get out of Dodge as fast as they can. And this is why that BRICS nation um, is, is increasing so rapidly. You have all these countries. You just had six major countries join the BRICS um, the BRICS nation, what, a month ago, three weeks ago? They're all trying to drop our dollar, which means they see something. Trust me, they all can't be wrong. They see something, and I see it too. 
And unless people are willing to stick to the roots and stick to their culture and stick to fighting back against these socialists, these tyrants, these totalitarians that want to fundamentally change our country, like Obama said, you guys remember when he said that? That is the problem, folks. You do not want to change something you already love. I love this country. Yes, we had a rough past, but this country has created so much happiness and prosperity for people. It makes it, it is the best country on the face of the planet, hands down. It is the best country ever in human history. But we're losing it because people are wanting to fundamentally change it. Instead of leaving and going to another country and bringing their ideologies over there, they want to fundamentally change this country. And they know the only way they're going to be able to change it is if by destroying it first. It's pretty sad, but this is why I think all these things tie together. The, the Joe Biden, Bidenomics economy, all the way to the education system and the government absolutely destroying the education system. More, more notably, the NEA. We have elite captures of all the, the, of the, of the teachers' unions. We do. These teachers' unions are not looking out for what's best for the children. They're looking out for what's, what's best for them. Typical politicians. Personally, we either need to get school choice for our children, or we need to defund, dissolve, and disband the Department of Education and get government out of the schools. This is the only way. Because government businesses can't fail. They can't. And all they do is just get worse and worse and worse. Just like everything else the government touches. In just two and a half years, we watched right in front of our eyes at record pace the destruction of almost an entire country. If we do not change course in the next year and a half, two years, we are in trouble. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't even want to begin to think what's going to happen. But it's not going to be good. And so, like I always say... We got to do something different. We have to. We got to change course. We cannot let these people destroy our country because I'm telling you what they want to build and what they want to turn this country into is going to be a disaster and is going to be a lot of pain, death and misery for a lot of people. Just like every other time when there's socialist change or totalitarianism or communism takes over a nation. It's not good for anybody. So. Last, last but not least, I want to get into this whole mask thing. So they're going to be trying to bring the mask back. They're going to be trying to bring the COVID, the, the COVID hysteria back. They're going to be trying to bring all this stuff back. The only reason why they're doing this, is they have to invoke fear onto people so that they can get these COVID restrictions in, bring all these COVID mandates back, and most importantly for them, the mass mail-in ballots. They need a COVID crisis so that they can influence the election like they did in 2020, man. I'm telling you. And so what I found funny, which look, we talked about this a few months ago, how there was an article from the New York Times talking about this. Uh, the New York Times came out with an article. This was a few months ago, I think back in April, maybe like April. And it was titled Explosive Study Finding Mask mandates are useless. Will any lessons be learned? Well, apparently not. So this is hat tip to Caleb Ho. So from an op-ed this week from the colum columnist Brett Stevens, the New York Times had its first coverage of an explosive new Cochrane review of medical studies that concludes there is no evidence mask mandates did anything beneficial at all during the COVID pandemic anywhere in the world under any conditions whatsoever. The question in the article's headline is, will any lessons be learned? Masking was a key component of the government's response to COVID under both presidents Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and the mandates remain a major point of political contention. To briefly summarize the Cochrane study conducted by Oxford University epidemiologist Tom Jefferson and colleagues is a meta-analysis covering dozens of studies covering several years of data on masking and concluded that, as Jefferson put it in an interview with Marine Damasi, there is just no evidence that they make any difference. Full stop. In this New York Times editorial, Stevens summarizes Jefferson's conclusions, quote, the most rigorous and comprehensive analysis of scientific studies conducted on the efficacy of masks for reducing the spread of respiratory illness, 
including COVID-19, was published late last month. Its conclusion said Tom Jefferson, the Oxford, the Oxford epidemiologist who is its lead author, were unambiguous. Quote, there's just no evidence that they, masks, make any difference, he told the journalist. But wait, hold on. What about the N95 masks, as opposed to lower quality surgical cloth masks? Makes no difference. None of it, said Jefferson. Well, what about the studies that initially persuaded policymakers to impose mask mandates? Quote, they were convinced by non-randomized studies flawed by observational studies. Well, what about the utility of masks in conjunction with other preventative measures such as hand hygiene, physical distancing, or air filtration? Again, there is no evidence that many of these things make any difference. The essential point encapsulated in the Times headlines question is about the blasting and shunning of mass critics in the past and at large. Quote, when it comes to the population level benefits of masking, the verdict is in. Mask mandates were a bust, writes Stevens. He calls out that the labeling of views as disinformation specifically including evoking, if not referencing, Twitter files revelations about bans, shadow bans, and censorship by big tech with the help of media, those skeptics who were furiously mocked as cranks and occasionally censored as misinformers for opposing mandates were right. The mainstream experts and pundits who supported mandates were wrong. In a better world, it would behoove the latter group to acknowledge their error, along with its considerable physical, psychological, and political costs. Don't count on it, he says. However, Stevens goes on to outline a mindset he says was at work in the mindless adherence to a policy and the enforcing of that view by institutions and social authorities and elites, which mindset, he argues, is also why there won't be a concession or correction after the fact, much less any resignations by public officials. On the findings, Stevens concludes, the Cochrane Report ought to be the final nail in this particular coffin. The editorial was met primarily with three types of responses online. Quote, I told you so. Of those who opposed the mandates and the predictable labeling of the objection to slapping the disinformation label on science as itself dangerous disinformation. There were also a number of objections to the study being relegated to an opinion piece rather than the health section of the paper. This is exactly. So even though the science... Is, is finished. Even though it is done, even though this is the largest peer-reviewed study, this is the largest, most rigorous study that was done on the masks, even after the study, they still will not listen to the science. These people don't follow science. They follow a narrative. That is what it is. They put the American people through hell with these masks, and they put people through hell with these mandates, and they will never, ever admit that they were wrong, and we were right. I knew this from day one that these mandates were BS, more particularly the masks. What they did to us with the mask mandates was hideous, hideous. And I don't even have to go through all the audio clips of CNN and MSNBC anchors calling people baby killers and grandma killers for not wearing masks. Well, I got the study right here. I read it. It's <clears throat> it's intense, but I read it, but I wanted to highlight probably one of the most one of the most important conclusions in this study because there's no way I can read it to you all here and besides I I can't even pronounce half the words. Okay, here we go. I, here's the author's conclusions from this Cochrane study. It's the physical interventions to, to interpret to interrupt or reduce the spread of respiratory viruses. And it was da- and it's dated, I don't know. There's all kinds of affiliations and DOIs and all kinds of stuff. Anyways, on the third page, the author's conclusions, there is uncertainty about the effects of face masks. The low to moderate certainty of evidence means our confidence in the effect estimate is limited and that the true effect may be different from the observed estimate of of the effect. The pooled results of RCTs did not show a clear reduction in respiratory viral infection with the use of medical surgical masks. There was no clear differences between the use of medical surgical masks compared with the N95-P2 respirators in healthcare workers when used in routine care to reduce respiratory viral infection. 
Hand hygiene is likely to modestly reduce the burden of respiratory illness, and although this effect was also present when ILI and laboratory confirmed influenza were analyzed separately, it was not found to be a significant difference for the latter two outcomes. Boom. I, there, there it is, folks. Why are we continuing with this mask mandate stuff? I mean, how many studies are going to have to come out in order for people to just, in order for people to, to just stop with these masks, man? It's like a phobia for these people. Like, you know, who, you know whose fault this is? Dr. Fauci's. And really, you can kind of blame Donald Trump. Look, I can't let Trump get away with, with everything. Donald Trump wanted to open up an Easter. He should have opened up an Easter, but instead he handed everything to Dr. Fauci, and this is when he flip-flopped on masks. Why did he flip-flop on masks? Folks, through all the other pandemics throughout this country's history, throughout history period, masking was never efficient, never effective, and never found to be effective. This is the biggest study we have to date with the most rigorous experiments, the most rigorous data, a, a ginormous compilation of data. And it says it makes no difference. So why are we continuing to go back to wearing masks? It's because the only thing I can think of is that they want people in masks for a reason. They want to invoke fear. They want to influence another election. That is it. That is it. They're going to put, they're going to force these mandates back. They're going to force the COVID restrictions back because they want to, they want mass mail and balloting. They need an excuse. They cannot do mass mail and balloting if they don't have any reason to, if they don't have a COVID emergency. This is what they're going to do. Also, what they're going to try and do is the Biden campaign and the White House is going to try and use COVID as an excuse for a failing economy, for failing Bidenomics. That is what they're going to do. So there's two, it's two birds with one stone here. They get to blame the economy on COVID and then they get to use mass mail and balloting again for the 2024 election in the name of COVID, in the name of, of COVID, in the name of a COVID emergency. That's what they're going to do. And so after what I just read you, I want you to listen to Dr. Fauci on CNN when this host in a rare act of, of courage, throws this study into Dr. Fauci's face. And here's Dr. Fauci's response. It's a truly bizarre response. And I honestly cannot make, I don't even know what he's talking about. He's talking about the broad, you're looking at the broad area and not the individual. Like, I mean, it makes, it absolutely makes no sense. You can tell we have entered the realm of just a religion at this point. But these these things have become a virtue signal for most people and a security blanket for others. And Dr. Fauci has no reasonable excuse. Why? Because he can't come out and say, oh, yeah, masks don't do anything. These people will never admit they were wrong. Unfortunately, they just won't leave people alone. I would much rather this guy never admit he's wrong and just get out of people's lives and stop talking and stop getting in front of a camera. And that's what I want. But no, he's got to he's got to bring all this stuff. He'll never admit he's wrong and he can't he'll he's never going to come out and say he was wrong. And so he's got to defend these masks to the death. That is what he's going to do. This will be the hill that Dr. Fauci dies on because this was the most controversial. Well, this was this and vaccine mandates were the most controversial thing that this country ever did. And it was all brought to you by the Biden administration. Do not ever forget which administration forced mask mandates on you. Never forget which administration forced vaccine mandates on you with threat of your job using OSHA. Never, ever forget which administration made people die alone in their beds away from their families. Never, ever, ever forget who these people are and what they did to this country. So here's Dr. Fauci on CNN. Check this out. I would hope that if, in fact, we get to the point where the volume of cases is such and organizations like the CDC recommend, CDC doesn't mandate anything. I mean, recommends that people wear masks. You see how he does it? This is exactly what they did during the last COVID restriction, during the last, during the lockdowns. Oh, CDC recommends. So essentially what you're saying is, Everyone's going to mandate masks because the CD recommends it. 
I mean, this is this is what I don't get. Just because the CDC recommends it doesn't mean people have to do it, but this they know people are going to do it. And so this is why the CDC recommends it or highly recommends because they know they know what is what is, what are people going to do if if CDC doesn't recommend masks? Do you think the CDC is going to come out and, and backtrack on everything that they've been enforcing the last two and a half, three years? Hell no. Hell no. That's never going to happen. And it doesn't matter how many studies come out. It doesn't matter how much science and data is there. They never will admit they were wrong. Here, I want to go ahead and get into the rest of this. I would hope that they abide by the recommendation and take into account the risk to themselves and to their families. And again, we're not talking about forcing anybody to do anything. Totally understood. There is a perception out there by many, how many I don't know, that they don't work and that the data concludes that they didn't work in the first go round. Respond to that on masks. Yeah, well, that's not so. I mean, when you're talking about at the population level, that the data are less strong than knowing that if you look on a situation as an individual protecting themselves or protecting them from spreading it, there's no doubt that masks work. Different studies give different percentages of advantage of wearing it, but there's no doubt that the weight of the studies, and there have been many studies, indicate the benefit of wearing masks. This is the, this is the biggest study to date. This Cochrane study is the biggest, most rigorous study on masks that they have to date, spanned over years in multiple different states with tons and tons of data. I would probably base everything off of this data, off of this test, wouldn't you? But why does he have to refer to all these cherry pick studies? I would refer to this study because it's the most rigorous with using the most data over the longest span of time. I'm going to refer to one of them. You've heard about it before. I heard about it from a number of radio callers. Uh, Brett Stevens in The Times talked about Cochrane. Put that on the screen. The most rigorous and comprehensive analysis of scientific studies conducted on the efficacy of masks for reducing the spread of respiratory illness, including COVID-19, was published last month. Its conclusions, said Tom Jefferson, the Oxford epidemiologist who is the lead author, were unambiguous. There is just no evidence that they, masks, make any difference he told the journalist Mayan Damasi, full stop. But wait, hold on. What about the N95 masks as opposed to the lower quality? Surgical or cloth masks makes no difference. None of it, he said. Well, what about the studies that initially persuaded policymakers to impose mask mandates? They were convinced by non-randomized studies, flawed observational studies. How do we get beyond that finding of that particular review? You just get beyond it. And say, okay, so the so so it's settled then. Okay, so we won't mandate masks. That's how you get beyond all this garbage. Just do what we've been doing for years, decades, and centuries before this. You don't mandate masks. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, then don't. But mandating them is clear and obvious a failure. It was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. It was a mistake. But these people will not learn. And I guarantee this this show gets banned because we're talking about masks. This is why they have control over people is because the people that are right are being censored and banned and the people that are wrong are being amplified. That is why the exact opposite of what they claimed they were doing from the beginning. They claimed they were censoring the people that were giving wrong and disinformation, mis and dis disinformation. And they were amplifying the people that they felt was right. Well, guess what? They were wrong. The people that were actually, the people that were censored by misinformation and disinformation, you know, the scientists and the doctors and the thousands during the, the Barrington Declaration, those people were censored when they should have been amplified because they were right. Yeah, but there are other studies, Michael, that show at an individual level for individual. When you're talking about the effect what? on the epidemic or the pandemic as a whole, the data are less strong. But when you talk about as an individual basis of someone protecting themselves or protecting themselves from spreading it to others, there's no doubt that there are many studies that show that there is an advantage. When you took at the broad population level, like the Cochrane study, the data are less firm 
with regard to the effect on the overall pandemic. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about an individual's effect on their own safety. That's a bit different than the broad population level. Did anyone even understand what he was talking about? This guy does this all the time. He throws out big, fancy words. He has no idea what he's talking about. And you guys remember that Rand Paul in in that oversight committee where he told Rand Paul he had no idea what he was talking about. This guy... It, this guy gets on my nerves so much, man, when he could just come out and say, yeah, you may be right. We just don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I certainly don't think we should be. I certainly don't think we should be mandating anything at this point in time. And I guess and I certainly don't think the CDC should recommend them. I think the CDC should say, look, we don't know if they work or not. That's it. Just say it. Just put the Cochrane. Just say what the, the study said. Just say it. The CDC, all the CDC has to say is the polled results of the RCTs did not show a clear reduction in respiratory viral infection with the use of medical or surgical masks. There were no clear differences between the use of medical surgical masks compared to the N95 and P2 respirators and healthcare workers when used in routine care, care to reduce respiratory viral infection. Hand hygiene is likely to modestly reduce the burden of respiratory illness. And although this effect was also present, <clears throat> I mean, they, all they got to say, they just got to read from the study. Just post your study. That is it. Let the American people decide for themselves what they need to do. I don't think anybody's buying this mask thing again, man. And certainly people shouldn't. And people certainly shouldn't go with it. We need to. I mean, we cannot comply with this BS again. This is all it's it's kabuki theater, man. It is like it turned it psychologically and, and emotionally broke people. You still have people wearing N95 masks in their cars by themselves. You guys remember people were getting choked out by police because they didn't have a mask on. You guys seen all the videos? We all seen all the crazy stuff that was happening. These people freaking out on their fellow Americans for not wearing a mask when they themselves had a mask on. It's like, why the hell would you care if I have a mask on, if you have a mask on, if it works for you? And then so they said all this stuff about, oh, well, it's. It's to keep you from from uh, uh, breathing out the virus. Well, even if I'm breathing out the virus, if you have a mask on, wouldn't that prevent it from you breathing in the virus? I mean, what do masks only work one way? What is this? It doesn't make sense. When you can wear a mask inside a restaurant and take it off to eat at a table, it doesn't make sense. None of it made sense. All of it is just kabuki theater. It was all just to invoke fear. It invoked fear in people. Unfortunately, it broke millions and millions of people that psychologically damaged citizens with these masks. And now people have a phobia and they won't leave home without it. They cling on to these masks like a security blankie, like a baby clings to a blankie. This is what these people do. And now they're about ready to do it all over again. This is driving people nuts. Just leave people alone. Leave them alone, man. Leave them alone. All the CDC has to do is just List this study. The Cochrane study is the most rigorous, most up to date, used the most data throughout the longest period of time. Why wouldn't you? I don't care what Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci. Oh, we're talking on an individual basis, not the the pandemic as a whole in a whole. I feel like he was just like moving his hands around just to like because he didn't know what he was saying. He had a Kamala Harris moment there. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous. We have to go through this again. We're talking about this stuff again. So in that article from the New York Times, I'll answer Brett Stevens' question. No, there were no lessons learned. From from us, apparently we're the only one, apparently we're the only ones following the science now. These people do not follow science. They follow a narrative. Everything about them is emotionally involved. Everything about them is emotional is emotionally motivated. That is it. They don't believe in science. They just say these things. They don't believe in science. Trust the science. I never want to hear those words come from these people again. They don't trust the science. They don't believe in the science and they don't follow the science. Because the science is right here. So it's just frustrating, man. I, I had a lot more to talk about, but that's really all we can get into today. An hour and a half show. So <clears throat> I'm going to have to... Uh, I'm going to have to shrink this down and cut it up a little bit and shorten it up. I, I wanted to get this. I told you I was going to get into this mask mandate stuff at the, towards the end of the show. So I wanted to go ahead and do that. 
A lot of stuff to talk about. I'm going to be getting back onto another show. I'm trying to put out a show every day, if you couldn't tell. It's uh, it's quite time consuming, but that's okay. I am, you know, we're we're coming up to election time, year and a half. I know it's crazy. We're a year and a half out. We're already talking about election. That is how important this election is. So the closer we get, the more content I'm going to I'm I'm going to be producing. I'm going to be giving my listeners the truth. I'm going to be informing anybody that's listening to the show because informed people make the best decisions. There is no way you can be an up-to-date informed citizen and go to the voting booth and pull a lever for a Democrat to pull the lever for a continuation of this disaster we've been experiencing for the last two and a half years. If you do, then that means you're psychologically broken. There's something wrong with you. There is no way anybody would want to vote for their own self-destruction like we're watching happen right now in front of our eyes. We're watching the collapse of our society, the collapse of our citizenry, the collapse of our, our, of our democracy and our justice system. People really want to vote to continue that? We, didn't, we were not dealing with this stuff during the Trump administration, and everybody knows it. The economy sucks. Everything sucks because the Democrats' ideas suck. They adopted this radical left ideology, and this is why people are leaving the Democrat Party in droves, myself included, because people don't want to do it anymore. People are not willing to drive off that cliff with this party. But this Democrat Party is by far the most destructive political force this country has ever seen, period. So. Um, All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is all we got for today. Uh, Definitely, I I will post all these articles. This study, I will definitely post in my podcast description. If you want to read this whole study, feel free. It's not that long. It's just really word intensive. I mean, you almost got to have a a medical terminology book on hand to just get through some of this stuff. But I will post it in my podcast description. Make sure you read it so that you inform yourself, get yourself up to date. I will go, I will post all the other articles I read in today's show on my podcast description. And then also, again, let me know what you guys think of the audio. Let me know how it sounds on your car radio or on your phone or on your AirPods, headphones, whatever it is you're listening to. Send me an email and send me an email, Stephen Torriello Show at gmail.com. Let me know how it sounds. Let me know what you think. If you liked it before or you like it now, let me know what you think. I personally, I think it's good now, but I don't know, man. I don't know how it sounds. I don't know if I'm going to be happy with it. So we're just going to plug and play until we figure this thing out. How about that? Um, I haven't managed to be able to get it to where I want it yet. So hopefully we'll get it eventually. Hopefully it's not too bad, but you know, I don't know. We'll find out. But yeah, definitely let me know if you got any questions or you got anything you want to ask me, reach out Stephen Torriello show at gmail.com. If you got anything you want to ask me, you want to send me an article, you want me to look into something, I will take a look and I will respond back to you. I love getting feedback from you guys. I think it's great. And you guys are doing an awesome job at sharing the show with your friends and family. We're doing great. We're getting serious now, man. So just keep doing it. Keep sharing the show with your friends and family, especially as we get closer to the election. Let me know if there's certain topics that you want me to talk about. Um, I had a suggestion from my brother talking about Victoria Newland. He wanted he wanted me to dig into Victoria Newland. He didn't know who she was, had no clue how involved she was in all of our foreign wars. And I will do that. I'm actually working on that right now. So I will do a show about that. He's right. Maybe a lot of people don't know about Victoria Newland and how dangerous she is and how we have people getting our country into war that have no idea or know anything about war. All they know about is money and foreign influence. That is it. These are some of the worst people our country has to offer. And she's the one getting our country in and out of, into wars all the time? No, no, no. So we're going to be talking about Victoria Newland and her role in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline explosion, what I think is behind it and who I think is behind it. And you're probably going to be pretty shocked. And I even have some audio that I'm going to share. So I'm working on that. But yeah, give me some feedback like that. If there's something you want to know, you want me to talk about, or there's something you're curious about, I will do my best to get that information to you and I will respond back to you. So, um, all right, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys have an awesome first day back to work. Get the week started off right. It's uh, We got a chance to restart. We're resetting for a whole new week. I hope you guys had a fun weekend. And I hope you guys have a good day. Have a great week. God bless you. And God bless America. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye.